Hello, welcome to this week's show, Legislative Update. I'm Jim Baumgart. Co-host with me is Nanette Bullabush from uh, Elkhart Lake. And we have, uh, for the viewers, we think a very important uh, program that deals with elections and fairness uh, and uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision that's going to take place in 2018. Mm -hmm. And to discuss this important uh, decision that's upcoming, we have invited Mary Lynn Donahue, who is a person that's involved in the case. That's right. it. Welcome to the program. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Delighted to be here. Exciting, it's isn't it? And it's I should... really exciting for well, me. And, and our, our whole fairness of, of the election process yeah. rides on this. It's a pretty important issue. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we're waiting the outcome of the case, but it, uh, it should be a uh, pretty important one way or the other. So when was it heard and when are you hoping for a decision? So the case is called Whitford v. Gill. Who? Gill. Okay. And Ms. Gill was head of the Elections Commission at that time. That's okay. how the case got its name. Uh, Whitford, Bill Whitford, is the lead plaintiff. He uh, was a professor in the law school when I went to, when I went to UW-Madison. And mm -hmm. there were 12 of us uh, plaintiffs from around the state representing districts that either had been uh, cracked or packed, and we maybe can talk a little bit about that, but in the 2011 redistricting process that the Republican Assembly did, that is an example of what we argue is extreme gerrymandering, which takes the ability of particularly Democratic voters to, to express uh, and through voting who they would like to have represent them because their candidates can't win. So, and it was heard, Nanette, in, um, October, uh, October 3rd, before the Supreme Court. I was there, Terror I mean, an incredibly exciting. In Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., incredibly building. exciting experience mm -hmm. for me. And I was, you know, right up front. And uh, we had about a half an hour wait when we finally got in. We got in line at 6 in the morning. Ooh. We got into the courtroom about 9.30. And then the argument started at 10. And it was, it, you know, I'm a lawyer geek, so I'm. this was like, cotton candy for me. I loved it. It was just so much fun. Um, and and these, these, court, these hearings are, are a mystery to us because they're not televised. They We'd are like not. them to be. They but we all have, at least I have an image of my hero, heroine, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sitting, you know, so wise, <laughs> and, and the other women who are now in the court and all of them. What's the, anything surprise you? Anything you didn't expect when you were there? Well, it was just interesting to see, you know, they sit in kind of a, a, a semicircle. And just to see those personalities in yeah, in place, right there. and so I was surprised. Um, like you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a, a she's, heroine. She's, she's for a rock me. star. She is a rock star, and she's this tiny little mm -hmm. thing. I know. And she's and the the chairs are big, <laughs> and she's kind of <laughs> curled up, and twice, <clears throat> and you know, she, the, there's a tendency to talk over her. And she fights right back. And twice she asked during the oral argument, what about our precious right to vote? Mm -hmm. And so listening to the questions that the justices ask of, you know, each side has one lawyer, listening to those questions, trying to get a sense of if it reflects how the justice might be thinking. So it was one hour of very, very intense concentration for me. And, and I was just so pleased to be there. Our lawyer, Paul Smith, was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, our theory on, on why this gerrymandering uh, is bad for democracy, I think, was brilliantly drawn by our lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I'm prejudiced, so, <laughs> so we'll but, see. But you're, but optimist, the, you're cautiously optimistic yes. that the Supreme Court will rule in your favor and against the state of Wisconsin, or the state lawmakers. Yeah who made those decisions back in 2011. Well, like I say, I have this Irish sense of doom. So <laughs> whenever I think something's going to work, it doesn't. Okay. So, so we won't say anything. I am not cautiously optimistic. You're, just, um, but, you're watching. But, but we're watching. And the decision needs to come down before the end of June, because that's when the term ends. Okay. Um, if our side were to win, I don't think there would be any possibility of redrawing the maps for the 2018 election. Okay, that's just too, because that's nomination time. papers need to be in by June 1st. Right. So, um, but I think by 2020, okay. those new maps would be in place. Hard to know. And so the ideal outcome is that Wisconsin lawmakers for 2020, when the new census comes out anyway, will have to redraw 
our voting boundaries, our districts, um, in a more fair way. Exactly. Exactly. And how and, just how unfair are they now? They are bad unfairly. Yeah. Right well, now. what happened in 2010 is there was sort of that was the Republican, you know, Sweet. wave year in, in yeah, the whole right. country. In the whole country, and right. that happens. Yeah, right. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, we have those you know, for Democrats and Republicans. Sure. Um, so the Republicans were in total control of Wisconsin government, the governor, the legislature, and, and arguably the courts. You know, we don't like to talk about partisan courts, but <clears throat> you do get justices' philosophies about... Yeah. Right. Conservative than progressive. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and they, the assembly redrew these maps based on the 2010 census in private. And they had a, a, a room in a private law office called the map room that was locked. <laughs> and so they had a, a professor who was very skilled in these things. And of course, the demographic data now is so sophisticated in ways that it sure. didn't used to be. Um, <clears throat> they were able to predict that in 2012, the Republican assembly would be about two thirds Republican and one third Democrat. It seemed it was particularly galling since in 2012, the Democrats statewide got 250,000 votes more, more votes. than the more Republicans. Votes. And they lost more and we seats. Lost and seats. they lost a lot of seats, yes. actually. That's, yes. And that's just because of the way the district was drawn. I live in the 26th. You are in the 27th. 27th right? You're in the 27th yes. now. But you used to be in the 26th, right. which was the whole city. The city has been cracked in half, more or less in half. And so ha the northern part of the city went to the 27th. The southern part of the city went to the 26th. These are both very conservative areas. And so now the 26th, which was typically Democratic, not always, but typically, it's very difficult to see under this map. It would be I, unusual if a Democrat could, would win. It would be kind of a miracle. Yeah. The 27th has always been pretty Republican, but close. Yeah. You know, it was. But now it's not close. It's not close at all. Yeah. So, and so uh, whoever is elected as a Republican will stay forever unless, unless another Republican runs in a primary to beat him. And that was one of our arguments before the court, is that this creates a permanent majority. Mm. Because even if the census were to change dramatically in 2020, the Republicans are still in control of the legislature, and they'll continue to draw the districts in such a way that Democrats just can't win. Right. And and it's a profoundly unfair, and we argue unconstitutional and, situation. And no matter if it was in another state where Republicans uh, were put into that disadvantage. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the U.S. Supreme Court recently took a case similar to ours from Maryland, where the Democrats did it, mm -hmm. where there was pretty extreme gerrymandering. And we think that perhaps the court is going to rule on those two cases together. Mm. They have slightly different legal theories. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. It'll, it's going to be so interesting to see what the court does. And, and we're very excited about it. But I think I, you said that out of uh, the 99 assembly districts in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. only nine of them are competitive. Are considered competitive. The others are days. so solidly Republican or solidly Democrat it would be very difficult for someone from the other party to win. Right. And Only nine where there's actually yeah. a contest that's exactly. interesting to watch. That's, I, th I just find that incredible. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. not democratic, is it? No. 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 I mean, that really, and if you keep one of our arguments, as I said, was that this permanent majority is, this is the best chance that the, that gerrymandering opponents have ever had for this to come before the court, we have a measurable way. This It's called the efficiency gap, and I won't get into it because it's fairly complicated. It's pretty, yeah, it but it is part of our theory is that we can measure. Judge, you know, Justice Kennedy said, well, we shouldn't in, be involved in legislative matters, which is true to an extent. But now we can say to him, you can get involved, but we have a measurement for you. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, a judiciable mm -hmm. judici con controversy. Um, and so we think that we've brought this to the best possible posture for a, a favorable decision, but hard to know. Yeah. Hard to and, know. and you said other states have figured out more equ equitable ways to do this. Right. Both Arizona and Iowa. Um, have, but not many states. Just no, a few. not many yet. Well, but, 
what legislature wants to give up its no. power to draw the lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's politics. And there's always going to be some gerrymandering going on or some redistricting mischief. I mean, that's just politics. Yeah, but it's just when it gets so extreme that there's no way of working your way right. out of it. So these citizen commissions are good, but they're appointed by partisan leaders. Um, <clears throat> I was um, uh, right now in the Senate, but of course it won't get a hearing because it comes from Democrats. Uh, Senate Bill 13 mm -hmm. uh, establishes that the Legislative Reference Bureau, which is an agency of the, of the state and the agency that drafts most of the legislation. I mean, right. if you want to get from point A to point B, you call the LRB and say, do this for me. They're, they're very nonpartisan. And, and they are widely regarded. Jim, I think that's true. Yeah. Everybody agrees that they're nonpartisan and everybody wants to keep them nonpartisan. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's one thing in this government that we Good. want to do. Because Republicans and Democrats both need that service and they want it to be fair. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if, if this bill could get a hearing, I think it's really a nice approach. Um, but again, because the Democrats don't come close, at least in the assembly, um, it, it will never get a hearing. Oh. I mean, this is, so this is a point in fact of when you have, you know, these really entrenched majorities that there's no way out of. That is something that if enough citizens raised their voice and contacted our lawmakers, no matter what party they're from, and say, can't you at least give this a hearing? Well, 35 county boards have come on board yeah. with resolutions supporting a fair election process. Good. And not Sheboygan. Not Sheboygan. No. <laughs> well, Jim, you're on the county well, board. Well, I'm on the county board. I can introduce the resolution, yeah. and, and, and uh, I may still do that. Yeah, and surprisingly, in both rural and urban areas, um, there's a wonderful group in Milwaukee called the Fair Elections Project, uh, chaired by a Republican and Democrat, Dale Schultz and Tim Cullen. Right. Sure. You They've know, gone around the state retired talking about this. Is Dale Schultz retired? Yeah, well, yes. Yes, right. yeah. Um, and no. these are two guys that are saying, this system is broken, we can't, we can't keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's hope. Um, either through the courts or through people power, uh, you know, because really when it all comes down to it, it, it is the people. And I think people in general, citizens are pretty wound up about the fact that these maps are so unfair. Yeah. We must end the program, but it's important that we bring the issue to the viewers in the uh, cable uh, network so that they understand that uh, there are people trying to make sure that we have uh, equal votes uh, equal people get representative uh, in the process and not a gerrymandering system that leaves people to think their votes don't count because every vote should count. So A, make sure that you come out and vote in the next election and B, watch the Supreme Court ruling that will come out in 2018. Thank you, Mary Lynn Donahue. Until next week, this has been Legislative Update.